This is More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is made up of more than your job title. Each week, I'll talk to a guest about how they discovered that for themselves. You'll hear about what they did, what they're doing, and who they are. I'm your host, Rabia. I work in IT, perform stand-up comedy, write, volunteer, and, of course, podcast. Thank you for listening. Here we go. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to More Than Work this week. I am really excited. I have Maz Alexander. She is a social worker, mental well-being coach, comedian. You can guess how we met already. And all around multi-passionate entrepreneurs. So how are you doing, Maz? I'm fine. I'm excited to be here and talk to you, Rabia. Yeah, me too. You interviewed me um, recently and I'll be on your podcast and you're going to you're going to be on mine now. So it's really, really awesome. So where am I chatting to you from? Well, today? I'm all the way in sunny South London. <laughs> and forgive me if you hear the police sirens, because like <laughs> I said, we're in we're in South London. So the, the police are always <laughs> on patrol. <laughs> I know. I know I'm in Camden and we have a similar presence, <laughs> I would say, sometimes. And it's sunny up here in North London too, so we'll see the day this comes out if it's sunny, but at least we, we are proving that there is sun here sometimes in right. the winter. Right. We have quite a bit to delve into today. So like first of all, we met doing stand up comedy and I think both enjoyed each other's humor and then just kind of realized we got along as people too, which isn't always the case in comedy. So just wanna say that, like that's been a pleasure Likewise. for me for sure. But your career background is well outside of comedy and so I'd like to just start with your time as a social worker and how you got into that. Yeah, sure. I mean, they're, they're not <laughs> they're not that dissimilar. Some some people would would call my job a joke. <laughs> so, and my whole life. But yeah, I've I've been qualified as an adult social worker for 15 years. So, I primarily work with adults in the mental health sector. And I I always knew that I wanted to help people in some capacity. At the time when I studied, I did a master's in in social work and I didn't even know you could do that at the time. I just had my daughter and I was going to one of those mother and baby groups and this lovely Irish lady said, oh, well, you've got a degree and why don't you use your skills for this? And probably I wouldn't have thought about it if she hadn't suggested it. But I come from, my family is in a care background. So my mother was a psychiatric nurse. And I remember thinking when I was small, I said, one day I'm going to free all of them. Because <laughs> it was the days when they used to have asylums and they put everyone, you know, even if you were an unwed mother, you, you'd be in there with every everybody who was a deviant. And I quite liked the idea of just freeing them. So, yeah, that that was a long time in the making. But I always loved the therapeutic aspect of it. And using things like drama therapy, although I didn't want to train and do the extra training. But yeah, always love to combine the two using some kind of performance arts to help people with their recovery. So, yeah, here we are. So when you saw to that that growing up, I'm sure you saw kind of the plus side of helping people, but also the difficulty in that. And so were you able to kind of process your emotions and just how it was dealing with difficult situations with people you cared about as patients, partly in seeing your mom go through that and maybe others in your family. Yeah, most definitely. I just wanted to make a difference. They say many of us who work in the caring professions are what you call wounded soldiers. We essentially have been through through some stuff who hasn't, and we want to make a change because we, 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 have observed, and I certainly did back in the day, that the system wasn't really supportive of people's recovery. And I thought we have to do something about that. The power dynamics I didn't like where people were being forced to take medication and being restrained and all these really intrusive, invasive kind of treatments that they had. So I thought, no, I don't like that. I wouldn't like it if it was me. So let's see what we can do. So yeah, that was my my motivation. Yeah, and it is it's just interesting going back to what you said about they would just loop everyone in, everyone who was quote unquote a deviant into a psychiatric ward of and treat all people in a way badly but the same. And I think I actually took a class in college, it just reminded me when you use the word deviant, I took a class on social deviance and we studied things like homosexuality in there, which was really I mean, it's so bizarre to me now thinking about how that kind of thing was just considered deviance or how you said unwed mothers mm. or something. And 
So you've, I'm sure in your career then, seen kind of those labels change a little bit, although socially, depending on who you talk to, they maybe haven't. But do you feel like in your time you've seen change and, and were you able to bring any of the change that you wanted to just in, in Yeah, work? there there definitely has been changes, you know, because our understanding around human behavior changes all the time. So certainly, well, in the 15 years, but even even before then, the labels that we ascribe to people. So for example, you know, language changes. We, we don't say that people are manic depressive. They have bipolar disorder. You know, people are no longer, you know, senile. We don't call anybody senile or you know, looking back on the historical notes, even when I first qualified, doctors would write things about people and say, oh, this fellow is a rather odd gentleman, very eccentric, and make all kinds of value judgments about how someone was presenting. Now, hopefully, we're a bit more accepting. There's more work to do. But we we try not to judge, <laughs> although we, we inevitably do. But yeah, the whole language has changed. Things like personality disorders, for example, you, you would not come under a community mental health team because it was not deemed to be a mental health disorder. And like you say, there are cultural components, all kinds of things, because perhaps when some people, for example, come to the West, we, we give them labels, but in their countries of origin, that, that you know, the way they're presenting is perfectly acceptable. So I, I bear that in mind. And, you know, everything is person-centered and you try and give people what they need without adding to the stigma, <laughs> you know, because people got enough to deal with without all the judgment that society will, will place on them. So, yeah. Thanks for listening so far. And I'm just going to interrupt the podcast for about a minute and a half or so to tell you about a podcast that I really love. It's called Art Heals All Wounds, and it's by Pam Mizell. She works in documentary films. And basically, she's super easy to listen to and has great guests, kind of like me, right? I know that's what you're thinking. One of my favorite episodes was when she had the directors and creators of Crip Camp, this Oscar-nominated film, documentary film, on her podcast. I learned so much from them and was really entertained, but basically all her guests have a story to tell. They are healed through art, and art is how they express themselves. The art could be what you think of as art, meaning something like painting, or it could be writing or filmmaking or anything else. So Pam's going to tell you a little bit more about our podcast, and then we'll resume with this episode. Thank you. Do you want to change the world? So do I. On this podcast, we meet artists whose work is doing just that. Welcome to Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. Each week, I interview an artist and talk about their work. As creative thinkers, artists present us with some of the most compelling visions of ways that our world could work better for everyone. Art around environmental, social, and racial justice, gender equity, ways to build community and bridge divisions, and solace for grieving. If we can see solutions to the things that prevent us from thriving as individuals and societies, we can imagine implementing those solutions. Once we imagine that, we can become the people we want to be, belonging to communities that nurture everyone and living in societies based on equity and justice. How do we change the world? One artist at a time. Do you think in just raising a child yourself and just in knowing what you've dealt with in, in your life, do you think that your work as a social worker kind of changed the way you approached things in your own personal life? Just seeing how maybe certain things impacted other Most people? Most definitely. And also my, my coaching, which I know we're going to talk about in a moment, but yeah. So in terms of, you know, things like diversity and what have you, I, I tried to teach my my daughter you know even when she was small you know when we look at difference and um, even questions like mommy why is that man dressed in a dress why is that why is that person not able to walk why so i've always tried to and not just her other family members that might be ignorant to it and even the cultural aspect because you know my family from the caribbean and when i tell them what i do it's like oh you work with those mad people and it's like I, I tell my, <laughs> it's, their understanding is quite funny. I, I tell my clients 
because I, I can be quite eccentric. And they say, they say to me, which one of us needs the medication, you or me, because you're off your head. And I say, I know, because, you know, really, we're all on the spectrum somewhere. It's true. <laughs> and I'm like, the only difference between me and you is that they haven't caught me yet. I said, they caught you, but they haven't caught me yet. <laughs> so, you know, and it's true, because <laughs> at any given time, it, it could just take one one traumatic event, one one issue to, that that could label us mentally ill that requires psychiatric detention. So yeah, I'm just trying to let them know I'm no different. It's just that yeah, I'm privileged to be in the job. I'm trying to help, and yeah, that that's the conversation that we have. And I love because I do workshops and I raise awareness. I do lots of talks around this in terms of raising mental health awareness because although we talk about it we see prince harry we see all the advocates you you won't believe rabbi how how ignorant to it people still are so yeah oh yeah i mean i was on a call at work the other day and this guy says well i'm gonna go get a rope and then he goes oh i hope no one knows what i meant by that and i'm like well we do and i said just leave a note i guess like i kind of got back at him on it because he's like oh you know he's one of those you can't say anything about offending people guys and i'm like you can but it's like what i mean think about what you're saying on a work call like that you're gonna what hang yourself like okay but is that funny Mm, probably not (laughs) like at some point you know like when you stop and i think when people stop and say oh i can't say anything anymore and then they say the thing. They've already had the thought process that makes them know they shouldn't say it. And then yeah. they still say it. I'm like, yeah, buddy, you know, maybe don't. Because maybe people have dealt with things on this call that you, sh- you know, you're not at a comedy club. Like, we're at comedy clubs. We can say what we want on stage, I feel like. But, like, when you're working in a corporate environment, like, chill out. You know what I mean? And maybe have an understanding of what other people are going through. I don't yeah. know. It's kind of weird. I, I agree. You know? And they say that they put they put that but. disclaimer out there because like, they know that actually what you're saying is potentially offensive. And, and you, you know, like you said, they've had the thought process. But you think that by saying that as a disclaimer that that covers you and, and it does. So, like you say, think about what you're saying. Why, why would you say that to someone, you know? Yeah, and it was like over that, like maybe get help if you're that upset over something silly, exactly. you know. <laughs> but but yeah, I think that there's different understandings that people have of things, and I think yeah, people like you speaking about it and educating helps the people who are suffering from different mental illness, but also maybe makes people aware in a positive way. Because my reaction was definitely not positive; it was just like, well, I'm gonna hit you back, you know. <laughs> So looking at your work now, and you know, you mentioned you're a coach. So first of all, how did you decide to move out of social work? I am still registered and still practice as a social worker at times, but it's it, for the long term. You know, mm. just like you, Rabio, you know, sometimes you have these epiphanies and you, you think, you know, one day, because effectively some of us social workers are glorified secretaries. We, we don't get to do the empowering stuff like back in the day like we want to. So sometimes we're, we're, because of all that red tape, we're filling in so many assessments, reports, and, and lots of administrative things, which is fine, but, but that's not really what we're, we're here to do. So, you know, sitting on a rainy a Monday morning, looking out the window, and I thought to myself, and not in a conceited way, but I thought, no, I'm not built for this. There's more to me than filling out these forms. <laughs> I'm far too creative to be doing that. So I went on a course and I had coaching myself and it it really, the transformative nature of it really spoke to me. So I thought, let me, and someone again, it's always, you know how life it brings you people and some some might call it divine intervention, whatever you want to call it. But I meet these people who who see things in me, they'll suggest them and then I'll do them. So another lady came up to me and said, oh, you'd be a really good coach. And I didn't even know. I was like, what the hell is a coach? What, what do you mean? Coach athletes? What, what's that? <laughs> so I did this course and I qualified in 2018 in transformational coaching. And I used those skills because there's a lot of transferable skills. And I just really loved it. And I do believe in the power of coaching, you know, which is based on the premise that we all are the experts of our own lives. You don't need anyone, Rabia, to tell you what to do. Ultimately, you know what to do. However, because you're so busy, and we often live life on autopilot. You haven't had the chance to have that that process, a guided, facilitated talk about your what you want to do with your life. <laughs> How many times have people ask you, what do you really want in your life? 
So yeah, that's yeah. that's what I love about it. It it was spoke to me because it aligned with my own values, and I just wanted to give others the same experience. So I am specifically a mental well being coach, and I I work with all mainly women because you know men don't tend to come to me, and that's what I love to do because it's more empowering than the social work aspect because of you know you're working for the state, in and you have to follow certain guidelines and. You, you don't have the freedom to explore with the patients what their lives could be, how to reach your potential. You know, in especially in mental health, it's a case of, you know, have you had your medication? Have you done that? You know, you're ticking boxes. You have to meet targets. I, I want to really sit and explore with somebody how they can live their lives authentically because that's what's important to me. That makes a lot of sense. And the parallels are, are pretty clear the way you've laid them out and you're still doing some of the social work part-time. But yeah, if you're not able, it's kind of like you have to be well and you have to be doing something that motivates you in order to fully give to other people yeah. too. There's a big aspect of that that I think care, carers and people who provide services like this, they they don't always get to recognize in themselves. Yeah. So one thing that just the thread, and you pointed it out, but I want to go back to it for a moment because you had people point out to you things that you might be good at and you pursued them. And that's a certain quality not everyone has because I think you have to be ready to do that in some way or ready for that feedback. And I think someone else listening, and I've certainly been in that situation before, and a lot of my jobs, professional jobs, have been because I said yes to something I wasn't necessarily sure about or didn't even realize I could do. And then in my personal pursuits, different opportunities have come that way too. But what do you think it is maybe about you that made you take the advice or take that guidance and move forward with it rather than push it off? And did you come across times where you realized you didn't take the advice or take the encouragement to do something and see that later maybe you should have well it's simply because i'm a star rabia <laughs> or no no uh, you know what i don't take every bit of advice but because you know <laughs> i believe not everyone should speak into your life not everybody is qualified to do that but along the way when you know you know when you you don't feel like you have a sense of purpose and you're not quite sure you have an idea what you're good at and you and you try and pursue those things but because these people have been strangers often that have said oh and I, yeah, part of me must have believed that I had the ability in the first place, but I'd never received the encouragement. So therefore I was curious. And um, yeah, I mean, I could have just ignored it. People have said all sorts of things. I've been told you're in the wrong profession. You you, you know, you need to be doing something else. You should be a lawyer. You should be, yeah. It, I suppose it depends who I'm receiving that that from if I if I thought they had my best interests at heart. But I was curious and I thought, well, let me see about this. If it doesn't work out, I'm always curious and, 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 you know, I always like to know. I always like to know. So I, I believed, I must have partially believed it, Rabbi, in the first place. Otherwise, if I thought I could never do it, I would have dismissed what they said. Yeah, and I guess it's that what you had said, too, about, like, you're the expert on your life. So there must have been something that you knew about yourself already. That's a good Yeah, a good point. I, I just wanted to explore it because when people, you know, you see signs, life gives you signs. People, even from when I was a little girl, people would often burden me sometimes with their issues. Adults, when I was a little girl, but still it happens today. And I'm thinking, why is that? People come to me, tell you don't know me, you're telling me your whole life story. Even on the, on, on the tube, you know, in London, people don't talk to each other. My friends growing up, they, they even even now say, you attract all the weirdos. <laughs> Why do you attract all the weirdos? I could be on holiday. I was in, where was I? I was on a Greek island somewhere. And this elderly lady for an hour. Now, you might think, why did you give her an hour of your time? But I, I quite enjoyed it. They just come to me <laughs> and tell me and, and look for, not that I have the solutions, but they just, obviously, I must make them feel at ease. So that's what people do. So I thought there's something in this. Well, yeah, I mean, even think about it just when we've been at gigs together, we have real conversations that aren't the same as like some of the ones where it's like, oh, where you been gigging? Oh, I hate bringers, blah, blah, blah. That's it. And we've, you know, so yeah, I can see that happening to you. And it happens to me. And it's, it's a weird yeah. thing, you know. It is. And actually, yeah, my, I was home recently. I probably mentioned on another episode just because it was so recent, but... I was talking to people like at the grocery store and stuff. Oh, I was talking to Rich Wilson, yeah. the comedian Rich Wilson, but 
yeah, my mom was like, oh, God, she's talking to someone again, you know? And I'm like, sorry. Yeah, you can't help it. <laughs> but yeah. it happens. There are a lot of, like, conditions around what you can and can't do in the social work because it's very formal with, you know, being regulated in a very specific way. But do you see any similarities between the work you're doing there and in coaching? Or is it for you just like a completely different approach? At no, this they're, they're similar. And that's why they're similar, but yeah, different. That's why the transition was easier for me because, this, you know, in your caring capacity, you are you you, with, with your patients or your clients, you, you you have to assess them. I'm constantly assessing. Listen, even when I go on a first date, Rabbi, I'm constantly assessing people. <laughs> I'm like, mm, do, are you going to get through to the next round? But yeah, no, you assess them. You, you are gathering information. You're listening to them and then prescribing a course of treatment or or suggesting some lifestyle choice or whatever you're doing. So it's similar. I remember drawing on my, my social work degree, you know, they taught us counseling skills because we're not counselors, no, but we use counseling skills. All of those things that require empathy, that require you to actively listen, which I thought everybody had, but uh, it's a skill because it, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. And that's why some people cannot talk to their family. I've had coaching, I've had therapy. And you know, our families do not listen in the same way because they know you they're, they're, and they can't be impartial sometimes. So that is why you will go and see a coach or a therapist or a mentor because you need help with a specific thing and they have been through that thing or they have the credentials. So yeah, there, there is a lot of transferable skills within it. I just find coaching more empowering and more liberating and it can produce those results more quickly than, than we would in other types of methods. That's great. And as far as like you said, you've seen a therapist and you've seen coaches, so you've done both. What do you think is the difference? And when a person is thinking about seeing a coach or seeing a therapist, when should they choose a therapist? Versus yeah. a and I've had clients like this who, who I've had to refer. I'm like, nah. And some people I'm like, no, you need to, you need to see a priest. I had one woman come to me, Rabbi, for an exorcism. I'm like, what do I, do I look like? You think I'm a priest? Yeah. She's like, yeah, oh. but you can hit me. No, you're going to have right, to coach you know the I mean? demon. So I was like, no, I don't, I'm, I'm not a healer in, in that capacity. No, love. So the difference that I found in having been on both sides of the table, coaching is future focused. And that's what I love about it. If you need to delve into, you've got some childhood trauma, you've got all of that and it's preventing you from moving, then you, yeah, you need to see your therapist most likely or a psychotherapist specifically. Depends on the nature of your, your trauma and what's going on for you. If you... For example, there are different types of coaches. I, I had a business coach. I have had life coaches, health coach, depending on what the thing is. But if you want results, like you've got some goals and you need some help just to move from A to B, then you would most likely see a coach. And there's nothing wrong. You might have both. It might be that your your trauma that you're experiencing and gives you all those limiting beliefs. So you want to work with a coach for that. But you have to know the difference. So clearly, if you have an acute mental illness, if you are still trying to get over some, you know, you, you, for example, you've been a, a veteran in the war, then yeah, you, you wouldn't necessarily see a coach because you need to address the root cause of whatever it is. And you can have both. I've had both sometimes. So again, it's, it's a bit compartmentalized, but depending on what the issue is. So like I said, I had a business coach, I had a life coach. I wanted to improve my relationships. But I also had some trauma from the past that I knew the coach was not necessarily equipped to deal with. And just another thing that I'll point out is that some people assume, you know, some therapists can be coaches as well and vice versa. So this thing about we're not just one thing, because often people are like, oh, but how do you know? They'll say to me and, and they'll assume that, that I, I haven't got the background. I've worked in mental for 15 years. I've, I've qualified. Yes, I've got I've got two degrees. I've got various. But they assume that, oh, because these days a lot of people just call themselves coaches, and I get that there are a lot of people. It's like you tomorrow, Rabbi, could say, well, I'm going to help, so you could call yourself a coach. But I would say to anybody who's not sure and you're choosing, that's why you yeah. have a consultation with them. It's like dating. You've got to be able to choose. Does this person really understand what I'm saying? Are they? Do they know what they're talking about? You, you'll be able to see that. And then you choose them because you, you're choosing them based on the results that they can get for you. What are they offering? 
you know, it's like it's like a salesman. You you only buy, don't you, if they if they can meet the need. So that that's how how you would choose and and do your research. Do your research because it like I say, it comes back to dating. Not you you don't like marry the first guy you see, do you? You know, you you might go on a few dates. You you check them out, do a bit of research, <laughs> and then you think, okay, this one's right for me because yeah, they they get it or whatever. Yeah, and that's a good point. I think that it's okay to meet the person and decide they're not the right person for you to talk to, whether it's a therapist or a coach. And I think with therapy too, people are in a vulnerable state. A lot of the time, they, a lot of the time go to therapy, not when they're in their high, but they go when they're in their low or when they're in a, a time of difficulty, that's very vulnerable, but it's like, don't, you don't need to make it worse by then talking to someone about it. Who's not the right person, whether that's, a friend or a partner or a therapist or a coach exactly. or whoever. Right? Exactly. Choosing the right support is vital because, and again, the credentials don't really mean anything because just because someone, when I had, I've had some awful therapists and so and I'm thinking, and they lacked empathy and I'm thinking, okay, you've been in this for, for 30 years, but you, you're like a robot. I mean, how can you be so cold? <laughs> or they they just didn't understand or they didn't specialize in the specific trauma that I had. And so they were very generic in their approach and I didn't feel heard or understood. And and of course, as you know, you know, if if, if you if a person doesn't have assurance that they are being heard and understood, it it delays the recovery process and further affirms those negative beliefs that you might have about yourself that oh my gosh I'm just not good enough nobody understands and oh my god you know all of that so you need to feel safe you need to you need to be in that safe space and and <clears throat> just not everyone gets it you know just like some doctors some GPs will have an awful bedside manner they're great they might be great in other aspects but they don't know how to deal with people so yeah yeah 100 percent so then looking at that I mean the the career path you've chosen of service can lead to a lot of emotional like tax on you and stuff. But then you, you're also doing comedy, which is a different kind right. of emotional tax, I'd say. But is comedy the first outlet you've had to get like move out of just doing the social work and the coaching, or were you doing some kind of art form before you got into comedy? Comedy is only recent, in the last five years, Rabbi. But my first degree was in performance arts, actually. And I used to think I was going to be in fame. I'd go with my leotard, my leg warmers. I thought, yes, I'm waiting to be discovered. <laughs> and, you know, the reality here. I had one professional job, and then the agency didn't call me anymore. And so I had to, you know, had bills to pay and all that, I had to retrain. But, yeah, the out in terms mm -hmm. of outlet, I always loved to be on the stage, no matter what I was doing, loved to be on the stage. And I, had, I put that dream to bed, but it never really died. <laughs> so, yeah, it's through different mediums. So, you know, I, li I like the karaoke. I, I like to sing. So if anybody asks me to do something, I'm the first one there. And comedy provided that. In fact, comedy is therapy to me. I do believe laughter is one of the best medicines. So it allowed me to laugh at myself. And I, and I don't take myself too seriously. So I, <laughs> I took it and I, I put it out there. And people laugh at my life. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, and it is your life. I mean, you talk about personal experiences a bit. And has doing comedy kind of changed the way you reflect on things, the way you process things versus maybe before when you didn't have that as an outlet? Yeah, for that? In, a, in a way it has. Um, because, you know, life will give you the, the material, <laughs> the content that you use for your comedy, even for even within my coaching, even in business. So... It's, yeah, obviously when you're going through some stuff, it's it's not pleasant, but looking at the absurdity of life sometimes helps. You know, when you're reflecting, you're thinking, ah, oh, that was crazy at the time, but <laughs> how, how crazy was that? And, and you know, you can you can glean some some humor in the absolute grotesque thing that you went through. But but I think it's important to do that from a place of, of your your scars, you know, rather than your wounds. Because, you know, if you're still going through some stuff, it might not be helpful to further injure yourself by by talking about something or, you know, joking about something that is not. It just depends. But for me, yeah, so I, I'm, when I'm joking about myself, it's from a place of my scars. And, yeah, that happened then. It was awful. But, ha, 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 look, look at me now. That, that's, that's funny. 
it's funny to me. Some people be like, oh my gosh, you shouldn't joke about that. <laughs> that's that's a private thing or that's, but I'm like, no, no, I don't mind being vulnerable, although I am a private person. And, and also it, it could help somebody else who's going through the same thing. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. And I like how you phrased it, that it has to be a scar, not the wound, because I don't know if you've done that, but I've definitely said something on stage too soon and I just didn't feel good saying it. So I just kind of left it for a year and then come back and then, oh, now it's funny or other things were funny and then something happens and I'm like, oh, that doesn't feel good anymore. So I have to wait, you know, so it's it's true. You have to kind of know when you're ready and, and the audience can, can yeah. tell too, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you don't want to be that person up there and they're looking at you like, oh my gosh, she's so damaged. <laughs> oh gosh, somebody called the therapist. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, you're, you're there drinking. I, I, have to, I have done it and that's how I know. Yeah, yeah, you have to be uh, ready. I've, I've done it and I, you know when you think, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have said that. And yeah, there's been times where I've gone to a gig and I've been, and, and then I've had to come home and I, you know, be crying myself to sleep like, oh my gosh, what were you thinking? But you have to know yourself and, and, there's, there's some safe material, my go-to material that I, I can use in, in that. But even talking about things like mental health, you know, when we're joking about things like that, you, you have to be careful. And what you say, your experience might even be triggering to someone else. But I don't think anyone could take that away from you if it's, if it's your personal experience. You know, as long as you're not too offensive with it, then... Yeah, I feel like there's a big difference between talking about your experience with something and talking about it just about people in general. And so if, if like I'm whatever, I don't need to talk too much about what I am or I'm not, but like, say I just talk about depression. I don't mind talking about that. It's mine. I can talk about it. But if I start saying, Oh, depressed people, like, look at what they do. They're blah, blah, blah. Versus like when I'm depressed, this is the ridiculous thing I did. Yes, There's a yeah. big difference. In Quite right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'm definitely and I was looking forward to like gaking together gangs. So I think it's always fun when we get to see what yes. each other's working on and, and just, I don't know, hear those parts of our lives exactly. in a different way. But one thing I do like to ask everyone is, do you have any advice or mantra that you'd like to share with the audience? Oh, we'd be here all day. I don't like to advise people per se, but it comes back actually to what I said before. It's for the one that I live by is it is better to know than to wonder. And I use that and encourage others to use that in regards to if you're trying something new, you're not sure, you know, it's just like you when, when you when you were moving from the States to the UK, you, you didn't know what life was going to be like, but now you do. And <laughs> now, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's grim and it's <laughs> it's like, what was you thinking? <laughs> but no, um, with whatever we do, <laughs> yeah, I just think whenever we're transitioning into a, a new chapter of our lives, just the fear will always be there, but I, I think just just know, don't have that regret of thinking, oh, if only I would have done this, or I wonder what I could have become. No, you can find out. You you can find out, even if you don't have the means, take the first step and the rest will follow. That's what I found anyway. So try it, try it. If it, does, if it doesn't work out, then you'll know, mm -hmm. won't you? But you've tried, so yeah. Yeah, oh, that's great. All right, and now I have the fun five. It's just the last okay. set of questions that I ask. So what is the oldest T-shirt you have and Gosh. still wear? <laughs> now, I had a few. Do you know, I just recently had a, a clear out and I gave some things to charity, but it's an old NHS. Don't tell them. I didn't steal it, but it's a it's an orange <laughs> T-shirt. And it was the 2012, was it round about the Olympics? Something happened in 2012 where we were thinking, and it's an old orange T-shirt. It's faded. And it has an NHS logo. And I remember I wore it for a festival to promote the NHS and all of that. And I don't work for that particular trust anymore. So I just, I sleep in it. <laughs> I just, it's a, it's a nighty for me now. Nice. That's cool. All right. So if every day was really Groundhog's Day, like people felt during the pandemic earlier, I, we're still in the pandemic really, I guess. But like in the part where we were locked down, it felt like every day was the same. What song would you have your alarm clock set to play every morning? Ooh. Well, probably it would be Optimistic by the Sounds of Blackness, just simply because that is, I even, I even still play it now to work out. It's uplifting. It's uplifting. The lyrics speak to my soul. And so I wouldn't mind listening to that if I had to every, every day. 
you know. Awesome. That's good. That's a good. It's good to get the motivating one. Sometimes people pick a yeah. sad song, and I'm like, oh, so. <laughs> So coffee or tea or neither? Yeah, neither. I, I don't... Actually, well, I, I drink mint tea, but the tea in the sense that you mean, and that just is because of uh, proper years of indoctrination. <laughs> I, I I was never a Mormon, but a family member used to take me to the Mormon church, and, you know, it was forbidden. So it's funny how things still stay with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not a Mormon by any means. Listen, I, I, I do all kinds... I put all kinds of toxins in my body, but for some reason... The coffee, and, yeah, the coffee <laughs> and the tea are just, you know, you get used to not having something. So for years, I've just not drank tea or coffee. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you don't need the caffeine, don't don't make yourself <laughs> need it. That's for sure. Yeah. So can can you think of something that makes you like just crack up or something like a time where you laughed so hard you cried and just what what that was that you can share? Basically. Oh, that I can share my life. When I reflect on my, the whole thing's a joke. <laughs> I laugh till I cry. And I'm like, oh, you're so sad. No, I mean, I do you know what? I think I'm very, I, yeah, I might need to talk to my therapist about this, but I very, it takes a lot to excite me. It takes a lot. Even when I'm watching comedy, you know, you laugh and you're like, oh, that was funny, but barely laughing. It's been a while. I guess it might be if I watch some something mm-hmm. like a, a Richard Pryor or something, some some kind of some kind of film. I, you know, I used to like watching like Whoopi Goldberg and she, she, you know, she was quite funny back in the day. But oh, I, I can't. Yeah. But any, any any watching anything with humor in it. Well, I shouldn't say anything because not everything makes me a laugh. But if it resonates with me, if I go out to watch a comedy show, for example, or I see something on the TV, it's, even if it's really sick. I shouldn't say that, but I'm like, oh, that's so sick that it's it's funny. It's like that that's wrong but that's that's funny <laughs> the, in the context that you said it so yeah it, it yeah. might even be something silly like you know my, my my daughter i shouldn't even let her watch it but you know even like things like uh, the simpsons or the family guy you know they're that kind of yeah it's silly oh, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. That, that sometimes i'm like oh my gosh and sometimes i catch myself i'm thinking, why are you laughing at that that's that's not right but <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, but that's fun. I think it's fun when it kind of shocks you and you just laugh and you're like, oh, I did not expect. If I saw that on paper, that would not have been my reaction, but I did laugh exactly. and I surprised myself yeah. by that. Yeah. Cool. And the last one, who inspires you right now? Oh, what? You mean other than you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> this is a tricky one because there is a culmination of, like I can say, there isn't one person. I mean, obviously, you'd like to be able to say, you know, all the, the greats, you know. Like, well, no, actually, Mother Teresa and those kind of people, they don't. But more recently, I've been, you know, I'm I'm not a fan of influencers or anything per se, but I have been lif- listening to more uplifting stuff. So podcasts and YouTube and various things. And there's a few people that, that perhaps you, nobody would know them, but they've been inspirational in the fact that they've, caused me to take action. So you've got people like on YouTube who talk a lot about finances, Myron Golden and people like that. They're not uh, motivational speakers, but what they say resonates and they present the information in a new way that I haven't heard before. So it's a culmination, I must say, Rabbi, of I listen to several people. I probably listen to maybe, and it's on my, it's, it's part of my goals in terms of improving my own mindset. So I listen to maybe four or five different people unknown they're not you know they're not like tony robbins or these kind of people these are just people just living their dream and doing what they do and it it really inspires me and i know it does because it it takes a lot for you to for me to to get my attention (laughs) because i have a very fast brain and so if you can hold my attention for an hour you're doing well and i just by those things. Yeah. I'm not, I wasn't a reader, but I've, I've been reading more. I've been doing so much in terms of self-improvement. So yeah, those are the people that do what they say they're going to do, that they're about their business and they've come from humble beginnings like me and they're just doing their thing. And I'm like, yeah, you, you, there's hope for us all. So yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I mean, there is a lot of content out there and then it's a matter of finding what resonates with yeah. you. So that's perfect. So if people want to find you, want to know about you, maybe they want to connect with you for coaching or they just want to know about your comedy or whatever, where do you want people to go to find you? Ah, well, if there are various places, but I'm so LinkedIn. You can find me as Maz Alexander on there. There on Instagram. If you, if you even if you just type into Google Maz Transformational Coaching, 
you're going to find me on Instagram and on other sites. But but feel feel free to connect with me, even if you just put my name in, I'll I'll come up. There's lots of <laughs> lots of things and forums where I appear. So yes. Awesome. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I'm really glad we got to connect this way. So thank you so much for being on more than work. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate, you know, you having me here and and having the voice heard, because that's the thing. I believe everybody has a voice and we should all be heard. So thank you. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about the guest and what was talked about in the show notes. Joe Mafia created the music you're listening to. You can find him on Spotify at Joe, M-A-F-F-I-A. Rob Metke does all the design, for which I am so grateful. You can find him online by searching Rob, M-E-T-K-E. Please leave a review if you like the show and get in touch if you have feedback or guest ideas. The pod is on all the social channels at at More Than Work Pod or at Robbie Comedy on TikTok and the website is morethanworkpod.com. While being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself.